tuned into the Entrepreneur Sessions, the ultimate podcast for startup entrepreneurs. I want to welcome everyone to uh, today's podcast. Volta is a self-proclaimed art and donut evangelist, and she wants to uh, spread the magic of watercolors to everyone who will listen. While born in a distant country of Moldova, Volta has, fa- has found a home in Dallas, Texas. Her passion is so vibrant, cultural, cuisine, and character comes alive in her distinctive, colorful art. To uh, share her joy of art, Vol- Volta started uh, Color Snack Creative Studio as a way to share tips, encourage others to live a creative life, and help build the next generation of artists by donating a portion of proceeds to local art education. Volta's mission to watercolor the world can be seen in the various projects such as brand activations, custom illustrations, and animations that she creates for the national and international brands. She also hosts local watercolor workshops where she encourages everyone to rediscover their inner artists. She calls Cedars Dallas home, where she lives with her husband and a cat. So I want to welcome today a Volt live broadcast today with Entrepreneur. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So Mario, I'll let you go ahead and kick off the first question. Cool. So today's, uh, to remind everyone what the theme is for July, the theme is a creative series, thinking outside of the box. So this month we're focusing on creativity and strategy as a place to visit. Now, uh, first question, Volta, how did your journey as an illustrator and a content creator begin? Yeah, so I I was always an artist at heart, but I didn't always pursue art. Um, in fact, in college, I went to study business and marketing. Um, and then for um, about a decade, I, I spent my time uh, working in digital marketing. So, but throughout this whole time, I always wanted to return to art because in my heart, that's that's what spoke to me the most. Um, and so I, I think like the moment that I distinctly remember where I decided I, need, I have to give this a try was um, I was flying back from California to Dallas and um, there was a lot of turbulence on the flight and it was just so scary. Like I, I know turbulence is very typical, but that one particularly just really shook me. <laughs> and, and so um, I just remember in that moment I was thinking, you know, if I were to die right now, I, I didn't even even spend any time at all giving it a shot, pursuing something that is all of my heart, you know? So um, I think after that experience, I was just like, I have to, I don't know how long I have on this planet. I just want to give it a shot because this is really what speaks to my heart, what sets my soul on fire, so to speak. Like I have to do art. <laughs> I love it. Um, so how do you typically, as an illustrator, you focus on creating amazing food illustrations. That's actually the niche that you work in. And I love that because I love the, the coin phrase, like the, the riches are in the niches. So why did you choose the, the niche of the niche, excuse me, of like food illustration? Like what was your inspiration for that? Yeah, I, let's see, I always uh, was just kind of drawn to vibrant foods. And for a while, I didn't really, you know, spend any time kind of delving into the the matter as to why, but I always just was drawn to foods. And then whenever I started, you know, my career as an illustrator, I, I saw other um, artists making it with food illustration and food art. And so I thought, well, if they can do it, this is definitely a thing. And I love to paint food, I love to eat it. Um, and so like throughout throughout my experience of kind of like starting my um, my journey as an artist and as an illustrator, I also kind of started um, visiting a lot of local restaurants that kind of introduced me to a lot of new foods and all that. And I also got to know the people that ran those restaurants. And so I think it was kind of like, a mixture of a, a different influences that eventually I was just like, you know, I really love food and this is, this is it. Like this, this is the thing. So I definitely want to pursue it. <laughs> I love it. I can totally relate because I love food too. So yeah. that's awesome. Foodies right here. That, maybe that'll be our next blog. You know, we'll just have to hit up a couple <laughs> of restaurants when they open up again. So, yeah. um, so, you know, a lot of times we, we, you know, as creatives, we like to think outside of the box. You know, we hate, I wouldn't say hate structure, but we hate being confined uh, because it, 
you know, kind of limits our creativity. And so typically, you know, with working with different companies, working with different brands, uh, sometimes they have the way of doing things. Uh, but how do you typically work with brands? You know, what's some of the processes, you know, from point A to point, you know, Z, um, when you first meet a, a potential client or, or a brand? Yeah, um, I would say, so a lot of my, like, kind of services that I offer for major brands, it would be like doing brand activations. So those uh, used to happen in person at in-person events. Now they're online. Uh, but the process was kind of like they were looking to add um, an element of maybe something memorable for their attendees. And so I would come in with my live painting um, services and, you know, depending on whatever brand it could be I would paint something on the spot and then the person would receive, um, you know, like an original watercolor illustration. Um, so it would be kind of like adding that special element that typically like a brand activation maybe doesn't have. Um, well, aside from them like introducing, you know, their whatever it is that they're promoting. <laughs> yeah. So that's cool. So your strategy was really like creating like unique experiences, basically bringing in this unique um memorable element to bring the event up so that's awesome I exactly that. yeah yeah so i actually i kind of stumbled onto that because i didn't know that was a thing before um i started my journey and um it just happened that some brands started reaching out to me and they were like hey do you do live painting and and i had to look up really quickly it's like what is like live painting like i paint while i'm there with you how's this work and <laughs> After my first event, it just felt so natural, and I'm uh, I've kind of trained my hand to like, sketch things really quickly, so I can knock out a, a lot like during an hour, and so it just kind of worked out in in terms of like you know offering that special unique little watercolor that people could take along with you know what, what you, whatever the brand is is promoting like um, a cocktail or something like that. That's awesome. I think um, I think what I really love about your brand and what really excited me about this interview today is just the fact that you've built a successful brand in the creative space. Because I know that a lot of people that work in various forms of creative, whether it's dance or graphic design, sometimes you have to fight to show the value that you bring to a company as far as like creating visibility and really telling the brand story. So what was what was your motivation like how did you keep yourself inspired as you were growing the business because I know now that you've established a name for yourself and you've kind of uh, built some notoriety because of the niche that you serve but in those early days when you were trying to tell your brand story and when you were trying to really develop your brand what were some things that you did to keep yourself motivated so that you wouldn't just say, hey, let me go get a job at an agency or let me just yeah. go do something that I know is guaranteed. <laughs> uh, I would say a lot of self work uh, went into that because I, uh, I just had to like work on my, I guess my mindset is what I'm trying to say. It's that was, that has been the key in me just continuing on and not giving up because in the first year it was very difficult. Like there a lot of challenges and failures, like things that didn't work out, but then um, eventually those failures just became lessons that I learned. And, I, and you know, now I see that as an opportunity to just grow. So anything that isn't working the way I want it to work, I'm just like thinking, okay, so how can I take it apart? So, and, and that mindset, I, I didn't grow up with that. It's was, I wasn't born with it. I just had to kind of work on having it like work on believing in myself because otherwise I, my dream just didn't stand a chance you know it's i really think no matter what we're after whatever we're pursuing it's so important to to have that belief in yourself and the way you do that is i think by just having that faith in your capabilities so believing in yourself and and just i guess being your your biggest like hype person <laughs> I love it. So for you, I mean, what was the 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 light at the end of the tunnel? Because when you're first building up that brand and you're you're like, I don't know what's gonna happen. Like, what was the I guess pivotal moment where things shift, or what was that big project that you got that let you know, like, I, this is something that's sustainable. I could actually do this. I could make. Yeah, this yeah. I I would say uh, definitely getting the evidence that my work is 
recognized and sought by brands like the Dallas Mavericks. That was such a highlight in my journey because they're huge. And oh, I, wow. I'm, you know, an artist who, uh, yeah, like it was, it was just such a cool experience. And to, um, to know that they, they believed in my talent to hire me um, kind of helped me get, you know, continue to grow my um, confidence and knowing that, well, they believe in me. I, I got to keep believing in myself. So um, it was just kind of, it was really neat to be able to, to see that kind of, yeah, the, just the evidence that it is working, that um, people are reaching out and my art is resonating with them and, and with brands and just with people on an individual level. I love it. So can you tell us more about the uh, Dallas Mavericks project, like what you did and yeah. some of the projects you worked on? Yeah, so it was a, um, they called it Art and Basketball Night, and it happened last November. And they invited about 10 or so local artists, and we all did a bunch of, like, we offered different things. So my part was I did an in-person workshop. So as people were kind of mingling and right before the game started, it was about two hours before a game started, um, people could come by, sit down at a table and, and I'd walk them through like how to paint something with watercolors. It was super beginner friendly. So even if someone, you know, had no prior experience to making any art, they would still like have, have a little bit of fun, kind of creative, unexpected um, type of thing that you'd typically not encounter at a basketball game. <laughs> So it was, it, was, it was a very fun experience. I, love I think this is a great example, too, of how you can have one talent where it may seem like there's no correlation, but you used your talent as a brand activator, as, a, uh, as an artist, and were able, was able to do a collaboration with a major national sports team. So I think that says a lot to your tenacity, and it also says a lot about um, where you can go if you don't put limitations on yourself. So I think that's awesome. Thank you so much. Mario? Well, uh, you know, different processes, you know, we go through different avenues as far as trying to get exposure. Um, some people swear that, hey, you know, we need to put, put money behind Facebook ads. Some people say, hey, we need to advertise in magazines. Uh, and some other people say, hey, you need to go to a lot of expos. So how do you think, how did people hear about you? Did, did anyone say we heard about you through a magazine or how, how do you get a, a majority of your clientele? Yeah, uh, great question. I would say um, about 90% of my clients come from Instagram. Oh, and okay. I know, wow. I know that's not a good, like you want to diversify, right? So like in the, I also try to grow other platforms slowly. It's, it's not as fast. I guess I hang out most on Instagram. So that's where, people come from right. um, but I would say like a lot of like the bigger opportunities came to me from um, networking like going to different events and, and just speaking to people meeting them introducing myself um, which was really hard at first honestly guys I'm an introvert like big time <laughs> <laughs> was super shy prior to starting uh, my own business I would not speak to anyone at all and so um, but I just had to grow into it. You know, I had to do it for, for my dream, for my passion. I had to do it. Because <laughs> yeah, a lot of people who are going to be watching this video, you know, they have different areas of business that they, that they run. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm always curious as far as how different entrepreneurs have kind of got their exposure out there. Uh, and then even as an introvert, you know, there's probably different techniques, different things that you did to try to get out of your shell. Is there anything that kind of like, okay, now I just got to take a leap of faith and just throw myself out there type of, you know, scenario? Yeah, I think uh, what worked for me was uh, really just kind of being really real with myself and saying like, Volta, you have to do this. Like, this is the tax you have to pay in order so your business can grow. Right. And um, the way I kind of forced myself, I just started, started signing up for different art fairs um, where I literally had no choice but to, you know, uh, practice how to speak to people about and like introduce them to my art, you know, not necessarily like, um, I always like, I didn't like the idea of being like salesy or cause that, that doesn't, it's not in my, in my character to be that way. Um, but I'm so glad that I learned that there's, there's really a way that you could share your story and what you do with people without 
you know, sounding like like a sleazy salesman. <laughs> <laughs> right. and so like through through these art fairs, I just kind of, you know, got used to just getting to know people, um, you know, seeing what res what kind of art piece resonated with them. Um, and then that kind of just helped me get better with time. <laughs> Cool, cool. And, and I was Googling you uh, before this interview, and you came up on D Magazine, um, uh, several different articles, as the most giftable, gift-able artist because of the unique designs and, and you know, kind of like the style. Um, so what inspired you to focus on the creation of gifts? You know, because I was looking at some of the animation you've been creating, and it was very unique. You know, what, what's kind of your inspiration behind it? Thank you. And I do want to say, I'm glad that you say GIF and not JIF. I'm definitely <laughs> team GIF. <laughs> You're coming from another graphical designer right here. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, uh, I started as a watercolor artist because I just, watercolor is my passion. But then, um, over, as soon as kind of like I, I started, you know, posting my art online, I noticed there were a lot of other watercolor artists. And so, um, my first uh, thought was, well, I need to stand out in a way. Um, and so I kind of started, got my, um, you know, got my hands on um, After Effects, Adobe After Effects, and started editing my videos that way. And then I, I realized that I could just, you know, create really short videos <laughs> and then turn them into GIFs. And also the fact that Instagram um, favors video content over static definitely was a huge factor in me kind of pursuing that more. So it just kind of um, made me challenge myself to see how can I, okay, I made a piece of art. Well, how can I make it move? Because it has to be a video for Instagram. <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. Yeah, your feed is always so creative. Um, I love like all of your posts. It makes me hungry like every time I look at it. So. <laughs> so um, jumping into the next question, like, can you like walk us through a day in the life of Volta? Like, what does your average day look like? What do you do? Like, how does your morning start to the, the end of your day? Yeah, absolutely. I start, uh, let's see, I wake up around six o'clock. Um, I usually meditate for 10 minutes. Um, and then I journal for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then I work out for about 15 minutes. So those three are really important to me because I, it's, it's just kind of like um, the three habits that I have to do to feel good about myself. <laughs> so um, that's how I start my day. And then lately I've been trying to incorporate with that um, a kind of uh, an art practice just for myself because I've found myself that, you know, I do a lot of art, which is great. I love to do it, but a lot of it is for other people. And so I kind of was craving that um, art time just for myself, where it wasn't for Instagram or clients or anything like that. Um, and so I kind of, after those three habits, I usually do some art. And then um, by that time, my husband wakes up and we have breakfast together uh, and then a shower and all that. And then my day starts and I typically work on different client projects throughout the day. Um, sometimes I will hop on um, some, I'm, I'm part of a couple of like art groups where um, they have Zoom calls and it's just a nice way, especially right now to kind of keep the community going, you know, talking to different people. And, um, so yeah, I, it's kind of, it's kind of like work. And then in the evenings, I usually just relax, play with my cat, <laughs> watch a show, to unwind, decompress, mm -hmm. and then go to sleep. <laughs> That's good. It sounds like you have like a really good work-life balance strategy. And also, um, one thing that I really liked is that you're an early riser. And when you read all these different articles about millionaires and wealth, the wealthy people, that everything always points to them starting their day early. So I think that's really cool. I really appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. And you mentioned like time, because that's one thing that I'm always working on, you know, when I deal with different clients is how to prioritize my time. So are there some tools that you use whenever you're trying to like, you got one project and you jump to another project? You know, what are, yeah. what are um, I use this uh, project management or like task management tool called Notion. Notion. Uh, have you guys heard of it? No, uh -uh, no uh -huh. I'm not. I want to look into it. What, what yeah, it's, it's really awesome. It's like Trello, if you're familiar with that, but better yeah, in my opinion. 
I just mm -hmm. I just like it a lot better. And so there's a way to like add different tags on your tasks and prioritize. And um, I just I prioritize based based on uh, you know how big the project is, how long it takes me, and like the if if there's like a hot deadline for a client that's meeting it by the end of the week, then usually I will work on that first. Um, so that's kind of like, yeah, that tool is definitely helping me um, staying organized and tracking my tasks. And do they have a mobile, is it a mobile app that comes along with it or is it all pretty much a desktop thing? I want to say, so there is a mobile app, but I think it just like uh, opens up your web browser. Um, but it's so slick, it still works really great. Like I highly recommend it. Cool. Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Product pro productivity hacks via Volta. Appreciate right. it. Because <laughs> that's one of the questions that a lot of people ask. You know, it's like, what what kind of tools do you use to prioritize your projects? And then when you prioritize it, do you base it on how much money you're getting from the project or the time? Yeah. Uh, and a lot of times, it's kind of hard to answer that. You know, because I get some projects where it's more long term, and I get some where it's like it needs to be done like you know tomorrow. Yes. Like, okay. How do I? How do you prioritize it? So. Um, I'm going to definitely look at the notion. So yeah. that's a great question for Volta though. Like how do you prioritize your project? Yeah. I mean, it kind of like what Mario said, it's, uh, if, if there is a hot deadline for a client, um, then I'll, I'll try to jump and accommodate that. You know, I, uh, I, I don't like to, to advertise that I'll do a rush order anytime, but I, I try to do my best and kind of like, like to surprise the client, like, Hey, I, I got it done sooner <laughs> kind of thing um but then you know if there's um a project maybe that requires a lot more time commitment and is not as like the deadline is in a couple of weeks then um i'll probably get to that after like some of the hotter tasks <laughs> I love that. And then, All right, uh, uh, different entrepreneurs you know uh, and business owners who, who come across you know entrepreneur um what would you, what's some of the aspiring, you know, I guess, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It just kind of left me. What's some of the inspirational quotes um, that you kind of live by uh, that you would share with other, you know, people who come to you as a mentor or mentee, more or less? Yeah, um, I would say uh, the quote that stands out the most lately for me has been uh, learning not to quit, but to rest. Mm. So I... Uh, I used to suffer from burnout a lot in the first two years. Um, I'm getting a little better because I'm like very intentional. For example, on Sundays, I, I try to just take time and not work at all, which used to be unheard of. I used to just work, you know, all through the weekend because why not? I mean, I have to get things done and I could get ahead and I could get more things done. <laughs> Uh, but eventually it just became such a like a vicious cycle of, of me feeling really tired all the time. And um, I, I've noticed that even taking like a day off in the week, I feel a lot more refreshed and I can work better. I can, you know, be more creative. Um, and so I, I think that's that's what I would share is like, um, and, and I had to learn this the hard way because when I would feel burnt out, I, I my initial thought was to quit because I was just so exhausted, you know, but after I would rest for a couple of days, I'd be like, okay, well, it's not so bad. I feel better now. <laughs> so I think it's like, oh, if I just rested and like scheduled that time in, then I wouldn't have to go through this. <laughs> I love that. So yeah, work -life balance. work in progress. <laughs> it's necessary. Work-life balance for real. I, I, I'm a hundred percent a proponent. I think, if you work, even if you're successful, if you don't have time and you don't take time for yourself, I don't think you, I don't think you can be the best that you can be. So I think that's awesome. And I'm totally for taking off a day. That's just a self-care day. Yes. To just eat or do your nails or whatever you want to do. So yes, yes, nice. exactly. And, and I mean like unplug from like social media too, because that used to be really hard because I live on Instagram basically. And and really like taking a day off of that was just so, so good for my mental health. That's awesome. Yeah, and then also trying to separate your business from your personal life too, you know, that, that's always difficult. And so like, what I try to do, I try to create a certain section in my house, 
you know, that's okay. This is business. Once I walk out of that room, it's all, you know, personal life. So are there different strategies that you pick to kind of separate your business and your personal? Or is it still kind of co, co and, you know, co-mingle? Yeah, I, uh, it used to be really hard because we, uh, my husband and I live in a one bedroom apartment. So it's really difficult to like have a space. But um, this year I invested in like an actual office space. Um, so my husband and I share that, but it's still nice because we get to leave our house, we get to go there, and it's um, still one room that we share, but, but it's, it's just work, you know, it's like strictly like we focus, we can focus there, and then um, it has gotten better as far as like when I come home, I can actually feel like I'm relaxing as opposed to before, like I would come home from a workshop or an event and I'd be like, oh, there's more work, look at all this work I need to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny yeah I mean I think that's really important um, especially I was talking to somebody recently and they were saying how they work from especially right now during the pandemic they've been working from their bed and it was hard to to find a stopping point and I was like sometimes even if you're in a small space it's good just to find a designated space that you're like when I'm in this space I work and mm -hmm. when I get out of that space but sometimes like you said you just got to get completely out the building and just get some like get some fresh air just get a different perspective so yeah awesome. absolutely. mario did you have oh no no uh up to you jennifer okay so to piggyback off of mario asked like about some i think some inspirational quotes what um what advice can you offer to aspiring entrepreneurs and business owners specifically people who are in the creative space that don't have a tangible product, but have something that they can sell. It's not something that you can hold, but it's something that holds value. Yeah, uh, let's see. I honestly, like, I would just go back to um, the advice of believing in yourself and what you have to offer. And, and also uh, finding a way that that, you know, creation resonates with another person. So kind of finding a way that it fits because I, um, when I first started, I used to think, well, so I spent like uh, seven years in digital marketing. So I had my business brain, but then I was also an artist. So I had my artist brain. And, and at first it was so hard to marry the two because I was either, um, well, when I, when I first started Color Snack, I also was still doing freelancing with marketing. So I kind of was still, you know, in the business mode, but then had a really hard time like applying that to my art <laughs> and I think it, it just took um, a, a, some time for me to kind of get it where I could finally see okay I have art uh, how can I what is a way that I can potentially help another brand or another person with it like how can I serve them in in a way that makes them look better and so I think um, it's just, it's just a matter of kind of trying to find, yes, you made that awesome thing, but how can it be useful to another person? And then um, just being genuine about it, you know, kind of coming from a place of like, this is how I would like to serve you. Um, so for me, it was, um, you know, doing those either like brand activations where I taught workshops or doing live, live painting events where it just made their experience that much more special for their customers. So kind of like trying to think of um, different creative ways of how you can insert yourself and, and provide that need for, for another brand. That's nice. Man, that sounds awesome. That sounds like, you know, <clears throat> what everyone, every business owner needs to apply. You know, it's, it's not so much about yourself, it's about what, how can you help that other business or client, you know, look better. Um, because I, I I, I have gone with this motto, you're only as good as your last client type of thing. Or, uh, or even like the uh, soup guy uh, way back when we said, if, if you don't look good, I, we don't look good type of thing. Um, but I definitely like that motto. So it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have any mentors? Um, anyone that you know you kind of look up to that helps kind of inspire you? Yeah, I, I have several. Um, a lot of them are in the art world. Um, I also have, uh, so let's see, uh, Katerina Popova, she's an artist that has just seen a lot of great success in her career and she's been doing it for about a decade and um, I've just always inspired by her and, and it, I think 
um, what initially like draw me drew me to her was the fact that she's also from Eastern Europe. So we kind of had that initial connection, and then seeing that oh, like another immigrant girl can make it, like so can I, <laughs> kind of thing. So that so that definitely was inspiring. Um, and then uh, another person that I look up to is Lila Smith. She has this program um, where she teaches people how to say things better. It's literally called Say Things Better. And um, I did some mentorship with her and it, it really helped uh, me kind of focus in on what I want to, like the values that I, I, I value or I want to show with my work and um, how to communicate that better. And I, I really think um, that's really important for any entrepreneur is just finding a way how to um, communicate in a way that isn't just, hey, I'm telling you about my business, but like in a way that connects with another person. And like, like you said, you know, serving them too, because um, yeah, like how, how, do you, how can you serve and make someone else's life better um, with whatever you have to offer? So um, yeah, those are just a few of the like, mentors that I look up to. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. So what's a risk that you've taken in your career that initially, when you took the risk, it scared you, mm -hmm. but it's paid off tremendously now. Yeah, I, I mentioned that briefly at the beginning, but I would say like the, one of the biggest risks, uh, it was like a huge monetary investment on my part to, uh, to attend this conference. This is like a huge conference um, and I had a booth there and it was, it was like my very first kind of uh, event uh, where I had to, you know, present myself and show my art. And it was so scary. And I don't know, and in my head, I thought, well, if I'm going to start doing this, I have to, you know, do something big, like something that's absolutely terrifying. And at the time, it was very challenging. Um, my booth almost like fell apart the second, it was like a two day event. And I came, came like, in the morning, the second day, my booth was like falling over. <laughs> I had to With the indoor or outdoor. I had to improvise and, and like redo a lot of things on the spot right before it started again. And then also, you know, in my head, I thought, "Oh, this is going to be so many people. I'm going to make so many sales." Um, and I did not. But <laughs> but what that taught me, like that, I'm still so grateful because I. First, I got to meet a lot of um, other local artists and entrepreneurs, um, but also just like I mentioned, the idea of um, it, it taught me how to learn how to talk to people and like get out of my shell and kind of just step into who I who I wanted to be, um, even even though that was so uncomfortable and I would have rather much you know stayed at home, not not done it. <laughs> I love it. Gotta do it scared. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Was that indoor or outdoor event? It was luckily indoor. Uh -huh. I, I did have an outdoor uh, workshop experience uh, when, of course, it started to rain. And that was when I learned that I will never do workshops outside. <laughs> <laughs> you can never control that weather. So. Um, yeah. so can you, like a crucial, you know, based on all the experience that you have in, in, as a business owner, what a uh, crucial piece of advice uh, would you share with other aspiring business owners? You know, the 60 second, second elevator pitch, you know, what would you, you know, that advice? Uh, let's see. Um, mindset, mindset, mindset. I would just say that I think it's like the number one thing that uh, can make or break a, a business or, you know, whatever venture that you start. It's, it's all about having the mindset to, believe in it or believe in yourself and your ability to continue to keep going um, no matter what challenges come ahead because I, I'm constantly reading all these like success stories of like millionaires and big time entrepreneurs and I'm just like all what I'm seeing is that the people that make it are the ones that don't give up so I really think like having the mindset to not give up is is what what can create success. Yeah, that's, that's true. I love that because I was reading something the other day and, and it basically said it takes 10 years to become an overnight celebrity. Yep, yep. And <laughs> the overall message is like success doesn't happen overnight. There's obstacles. You know, full transparency. I had technical issues today for the first time logging in, but the show must go on. So I think that that is um, an awesome 
piece of advice that if people really apply it, they will see success. So thank, thank you for you. sharing that. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, that picture of an iceberg and people see just the top. Uh, it's yeah. like, oh, this is the success. But then underneath it is like all the learnings that we've done and all, all the things that didn't work. <laughs> exactly. I love that. Awesome. So basically, how can our listeners of the podcast connect with you? What are your social handles? All of those great details. Yeah, I'm uh, at Color Snack on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. Uh, and then my website is colorsnack.com. Um, and yeah, I mostly hang out on Instagram. It's true. I love it. I'm addicted. <laughs> awesome. 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 Stella, did we have a question from you real quick that you wanted to ask Volta before we end the podcast? No. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Awesome. Well, Volta, thank you so, so much for joining us today. We're going to continue to follow everything that you're doing. Again, it's Instagram.com slash color snack. Yes. And... Please, if you have any graphic needs, this is the person you need to reach out to. The magazine said so too. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much for joining. And we will see everybody on the next episode of Entrepreneur Session. Thank Bye. you so much, Jennifer and Mario. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.